Good morning. Uh, my name is Sadi Gallagher, President and CEO of the Buffalo and Agri Partnership. Welcome uh, to today's Growing a Cannabis Economy Lessons from Hamilton, Ontario webisode. And thank you so much for starting your day with us. Uh, to say 2021 was a year of fast moving information and change would certainly be an understatement. And while COVID-19 and its impact on our community and economy has dominated our collective attention, there is no economic opportunity uh, that's presented itself. New York State legalized adult use cannabis and expanded its existing medical marijuana and cannabinoid uh, hemp programs on March 31st, 2021 through the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act, MRTA, after years of deliberation and discussion. This new law will have significant short and long-term effects on the state and Buffalo Niagara's regional economy. With the full guideline scheduled for a late 2021 release, there are many questions about how this regulatory framework will, will function and how, when, how and when local growers, manufacturers, and retailers can start the local approval process. Luckily for the Buffalo Niagara region, we can ask our neighbors to the north for some guidance and expertise. Canada's Cannabis Act of 2018 legalized recreational cannabis and established a provincial regulatory structure for cannabis production, sale, and use for use and rules for the workplace. As New York and our region moves forward in this new cannabis economy, we have a lot to learn from uh, Hamilton, Ontario's experience in recent years, and we're really fortunate to be joined by industry leaders with important expertise. So I'd like to introduce you to today's panel. Keenan Loomis is president and CEO of the Hamilton Ontario Chamber of Commerce, an organization dedicated to strengthening the economic engine of the Hamilton community. The Hamilton Chamber is an established advocate for legalized cannabis to grow the commercial tax base and advanced manufacturing, and has also consistently provided comprehensive and public analysis of Ontario's cannabis market from the perspective of industry and the role policy can play to ensure the legal market remains competitive. The Hamilton Chamber is a strategic partner of the partnership, and we enjoy a strong working relationship with Keenan and his team. And it's nice to see him after so many months of us not being able to see one another. George Smitherin is president and CEO of the Cannabis Council of Canada, the national organization of licensees of cannabis on record with Health Canada. The council's mission is to act as the national voice for its members in their promotion of industry standards, support the development, growth, and integrity of the regulated cannabis industry. George also has four decades of political and governmental service at the local, provincial, and national level, including roles as chief of staff to the mayor of Toronto and as a senior assistant to the provincial and federal ministries. Corinne Cousineau is director of government relations and sustainability at the Green Organic Dutchman and a Cannabis Council of Canada board member. The Green Organic Dutchman is a certified organic cannabis grower with facilities in Canada with a focus on environmentally conscious production practices. Corinne oversees the company's government relations strategy and spearheads its sustainability program. Before we start our panel discussion, I wanna highlight another uh, webisode that we're putting on focused on legalized cannabis in New York State. Our Manufacturing Council will host a webisode at 8 a.m. on Thursday, July 15th, to discuss how legalized cannabis will change workforce policies. We will hear from legal and human resource experts about how companies of all sizes can adapt to the new regulations and effectively communicate the changes to employees and stakeholders. Please uh, visit our events page at thepartnership.org to register for this free event. So now we're going to uh, get on to our panel discussion and we wanna answer as many questions from the audience as possible. Uh, you'll see a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please type your questions there. And if you see a question that is one that you've, uh, you've asked or see asked or you wanna ask, and it looks similar to the one you wanna ask, hit the like button so that we, uh, we can elevate that question to the top of the list. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started. So Keenan, I think we should start with you. Um, from, from your perspective, what have been the largest economic successes of legalizing cannabis in Canada? And more specifically, how has it impacted Hamilton? Thanks, Dottie. It's great to see you. I, uh, I miss you. I miss Buffalo. I miss America right now, too. <laughs> so uh, hopefully we can resume cross-border travel uh, sometime very soon and I can get to see my uh, my family in uh, central New York. Um, yeah, when when this popped up, I, I, I get your, uh, your advocacy uh, emails and I saw that uh, this had happened. I thought, what a great opportunity to re-engage with you. We haven't had much of a chance over the, the last year and a half or so. Um, and to share some of our stories because we just went through this uh, process. 
And uh, I really care about uh, New York. As you know, I'm a native uh, central New Yorker. And uh, I just, I hope it really goes well for, for you. And um, I wish that, you know, I had been able to, uh, to tap into some expertise from people who had been through this uh, just before we had as well. Really, really interesting stuff, um, how it all happens, the, the regulatory framework that, that comes into being. I, I, I definitely encourage you, if, if you have an opportunity, weigh in on that. Make sure that you do canvas around um, and look at jurisdictions that have uh, best practices. Um, and uh, there's a lot of things you can do to make sure that you have success uh, right away. A lot of things you can do to as well, just really stumble out of the gate. So um, I think it's important to get that right. And I think it's important as well to, to really truly understand the economic opportunities here. Um, there are many, uh, certainly what we have found here in Hamilton, we have 70% um, 70 per, 70 of our land area is agricultural. And so we certainly have a lot of licensed producers that are operating in the agricultural area of, of Hamilton. Uh, the Green Organic Dutchman being one of them. Um, but we also have a number of licensed producers that are operating in the, the urban uh, uh, industrialized areas as well, uh, repurposing some of the, uh, the buildings and facilities that uh, haven't seen a lot of activity of late. So we have a lot of licensed producers uh, here in Hamilton. And not only that, we have a, a ton of retailers as well. Um, and this is really where the, the interesting um, part happened for us and, and you know, you guys will probably experience this as well. That period between when it's legalized, but the the, the framework and, and the regulatory regime, and then the um, the uh, distribution uh, um, channels haven't yet been really fully fledged out, and so you'll get this interregnum period between you know legalization and 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 we're still not actually in, in the in a spot where things are operating really like. Normally, um, we haven't settled uh, down yet. Um, I don't know how many years it's going to take, um, but what we have found, we have over a hundred uh, cannabis uh, retail uh, stores here in Hamilton now operating. We had 80 illegal uh, stores uh, popping up when legalization was announced. And so this is gonna be one of the issues that you're probably gonna to have to deal with as a community, but it's become a, a huge part of our economy. And um, you know, there, there's no going back from this. When, once, you know, as you know, once you get the, the taste of, of revenue rolling in, um, it will become an established part of, of your community and, uh, and your business community as well and your operations at the Buffalo Niagara Park partnership. But I brought two amazing experts for you. I, d I know nearly, you know, <laughs> nothing compared to, uh, to the folks that uh, we have brought to you. So George and Kareen, uh, I'm, I'm going to learn a lot from from them as well. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Keenan. And, and we're in that we're in that Bermuda Triangle right now of it's legal, but we don't know we don't know how to start. And we definitely want to be positioned to take advantage, you know, ag is a big uh, is a big opportunity in our region, uh, not so much in, in center of Buffalo, although there are actually cannabis um, companies looking to establish in industrial parks in, in even in, in our urban areas. So, so George, did, did, let, let me ask you a question. Um, did Canadians underestimate the effort associated with birthing a new legal industry? I mean, this is sort of like really an interesting dynamic where something has been illegal and now it's legal and, and, and how that sort of comes to Keenan's point where it really starts to um, bear economic fruit. Uh, George, to tell us your perspective on, on that. I don't know whether it was underestimated, but I would say I tell anyone that wants to listen that the cannabis industry is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> and um, sometimes when you're in a regulated environment where government gives you a license, people operate with the perception that it's a license to print money. And it's mm. been a very challenging environment for companies like Karin's because they had to put up significant investment for many, many years on the capital and operating front before they could have an ounce of revenue. So that's a very challenging environment for any sector. But that having been said, uh, the billions and billions of dollars of gross domestic product and the tens of thousands of jobs at all different levels really does speak to the wide extent of the investment. I think if there's one thing that that's, runs the risk of being uh, underestimated, it is the entrenched nature of the illicit cannabis marketplace. Mm. So while we are all entering into an exciting new world where you see the potential for growth in a sector which is largely unrealized by any other sector, it's important to keep in mind there are many features of the uh, entrenched market 
which need to be addressed as matters of public policy. And I think that the United States has an opportunity, uh, various of the states have opportunities to even improve on the work that we've done in Canada. And I would compliment many of the models in the United States, which have a much stronger equity and record expungement type focus on mm -hmm. the citizenry. Whereas our policy was introduced largely with kind of a criminal justice focus, mm -hmm. keeping cannabis away from youth and trying to restrict the illicit market. So I think that the United States, various of the states are in very powerful position to build on the work that we did. And I'm very excited to watch as it emerges. And I think yeah. that the thing yeah. I would say is that regions and cities can choose for themselves whether, whether to be winners or losers. And the reason that I say that is there's a lot of stigma. Wherever you're bringing cannabis into play, uh, even amongst governments that support it and legalized it, there's still stigma built over decades and decades and decades of anti-drug kind of initiatives and stuff. And people should also be, you know, eyes wide open about that. And so how does that, George, how does, just to play on that, how does that impact really um, a region, let's say? So what you're saying is sort of the position that Keenan and his group has taken, which is to be sort of very pro the economic opportunity. Are you saying that, that, that that's a vital piece in order for a region to, to, to take advantage of it? I guess, it's, I guess, yeah. I, I guess I'm asking you, how does it, how do, how do we, how do we take advantage of it here, I guess? I'll give the best example that I could give Dottie builds on the stigma point that I made before. Canada's banks are largely not engaged in the legal cannabis industry, despite the fact that it's billions of dollars large. There are accounts here and there, but largely it's been the biggest banks have uh, taken a pass on proactive engagement in the cannabis space. That's provided an opportunity for savings and loans and other mm -hmm. style of financial services to offer support to this burgeoning industry. Now, if we look at the United States and at New York State, you have more of a model of regional banks and such. We have just a few massive banks spread across the country. So a bank, as an example, that, that, that anchors a community chooses to be proactive in trying to support and build their book of business in this industry, that's going to that's going to hold that community out uh, in contrast to other communities that just aren't proactive about it. So uh, I, I think that's uh, really, really uh, great to see that uh, uh, Buffalo Niagara is focused on this early on because uh, there are there will be there can be winners and losers, let's say that way, from an economic measurement standpoint. Well, you know, your point earlier, George, about um, the, the approach of equity and sort of uh, restorative justice, if you will, as it relates to cannabis, really was the reason why um, it took so long for it to pass in New York State. Um, uh, Crystal People Stokes, who was really the champion, our, um, she's actually from our area of New York uh, and is the majority leader now, she, she was just just emphatic on the fact that you know that there had we had to build equity through the legalization, and so um, I appreciate your comment, and she will too. We'll make sure we we share it with her. Um, so so before I move on to Corinne, uh, George, t tell me how Canada did address the uh, existing illicit market, and uh, what is the status of how that you you refer to this, but as, as sort of a point of challenge. So tell us what you did. And if you could sort of go back to the beginning and you were us, what, what should, what, what should we as a region be on a lookout, look out for in terms of the illicit market? Well, it's easier to tell you what happened. The, the, the <laughs> solutions are tough. The, so okay. the solutions are really tough because in a certain sense, you're asking, um, you're asking regular, you could be asking regulators to overlook a uh, to overlook a lengthy pattern of activity outside of regulation or law, and that's sometimes uh, challenging. What I would say is that um, in Canada, we rebuilt all of our growing uh, capacity. We didn't uh, figure out where the growing capacity was and seek a way to transition those participants into the legal market. Largely, we built all the capacity we could ever need and then some. So mm -hmm. we did have an, we did overshoot. Uh, be, I, I, I really think the reason for that is our national government never established any kind of uh, limits on the amount of cannabis that could be grown. They just offered a licensing regime, anybody that wished to apply for it and had the patience and financial resources to go through it could get licensed. Mm -hmm. Belatedly, the government has focused what's called a micro uh, cultivator or micro processor license 
towards trying to convert what we refer to euphemistically as legacy market participants to participate in the legal market. And mm -hmm. this is a strategy on a regional basis, which is being applied most aggressively in British Columbia, which is you know, thought in Canada to have had, let's say, the strongest entrenched uh, legacy uh, market. But I would, I would say that for all of these efforts, we have a situation today where we're probably, pos we, it, I guess it's all based on statistical, uh, is all based on statistical analysis that is not exactly, uh, uh, that is not exactly to be counted on. But, you know, right now we're predicting possibly that we've achieved 50% of the uptake of the overall market. Some people think that that's uh, high. Some people think that the illicit market is still the majority market in Canada. So this mm -hmm. really does speak to a challenge, particularly because we've had companies invest, you know, pretty much $20 billion uh, and we've got all of this tremendous capacity out there, but the entrenched nature of the illicit market is very strong and they have a lot of price advantage. You know, they have some advantages on their side, including well-established networks, relationships, and obviously not the same burden of price and taxation that we're experiencing. So yeah. that is, uh, uh, th th you know, I think that's posing, uh, really three years, pretty much three years into it, I really think that stands out for our industry as, you know, the biggest threat that we're facing is we built all this capacity and we're trying hard to pay for it. Uh, but uh, we sure uh, would benefit from selling more, uh, you know, being able to sell a higher proportion of the cannabis overall. And we're, we're, we're growing every month. The sales are increasing. Don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, but there's uh, impatience in a certain sense because there's still quite a bit of activity in our illicit markets. Yeah. Well, if the border were open, <laughs> you'd have a lot more customers uh, from this side. For sure. Well, Dottie, so, Dottie, Dottie, just to say one thing clearly, I'm very excited by New York state law and especially by the consumption as consumption lounge aspect. And I'll definitely when, you know, when all of that regulation gets done, all of those places are open. I'll definitely be a consumer coming across the border to uh, take advantage of that offering because the, the, the New York law uh, offers many, many, uh, progressive advances over uh, the foundation of law that we have here naturally because it, you know it comes a little later so uh, yeah. I, I was really excited to see many aspects of the New York proposal. Thank you George. Um, Corinne uh, let's let's uh, shift to, to, to you here. So how has uh, the cannabis industry in Canada supported economic growth for other industries and what support products or services are now in higher demand and and actually uh, before you answer that question tell us a little bit about um, your company and uh, you know just what you do and your volumes and and when you were established knowledge just give us a little bit of color on on your business sure so uh, thank you for having me um, the green organic Dutchman as uh, Keenan was saying earlier has been founded in Hamilton um, so we have about 180,000 square foot uh, in Hamilton. We have about 150 employees. Um, we uh, are um, different than other producer as you know, as you said earlier, we're certified organic uh, to Canadian standards, uh, certified by ProCert. Um, and uh, we grow in living soil, which not a lot of people know that most cannabis actually doesn't grow in living soil, but in a uh, rock wool kind of material. Um, we use natural sunlight, so we try to minimize our impact on the planet basically by, uh, by growing our cannabis. And I think, you know, looking at California and markets that are a bit more evolved, I think that, that probably the next discussion around our industry is going to be around the sustainability. Um, right now, we're, you know, more focused uh, as an industry, maybe on the uh, economic sustainability, because we need to uh, be able to uh, get some of that money back that uh, George was talking about all the investments that were that were made. Uh, but it's uh, definitely going to be a, a growing subject. Um, we also um, are operating in Quebec, uh, in Valleyfield. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, field to be in. Um, we are basically building a plane and flying it at the same time. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we don't have the flight plan because it changes. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're basically uh, trying to, you know, see the future. Um, I remember I've been in the industry for two and a half years. I've been a tea god. And, uh, you know, when we were first started, the regulations, um, outdoor grow was, was uh, not permitted. Uh, and then suddenly, you know, the regulations changed. And then all these companies like us and others who had 
spend millions of dollars, you know, building these fancy greenhouses. Um, then there was a competitor that could grow for a few cents on the, you know, a, a gram um, not too far from us. So it's been quite interesting. Um, in terms of other industry, I mean, it's everything. Uh, for a while, if you were in, in regular agriculture and you wanted a greenhouse, good luck, because everyone <laughs> working in the greenhouse industry was actually building for, for cannabis. Um, now, a lot of these greenhouses, unfortunately, are for sale. Uh, because we overshot, as, as George was saying, um, but it's everything from, you know, uh, you know, their local restaurants, uh, the security, uh, uh, you, basically anything, you name it, right? It's, it's basically a brand new, like, I think for New York, they're estimating there's going to be $2.3 billion in four years, brand new industry just popping out. Um, and that's what attracted me to it is like, when in our life do we have the chance to join such a brand new industry. Um, and it's a fabulous uh, occasion for people to actually change careers or, or learn something new because there isn't that many people that have the, um, the experience basically, right? So um, yeah, I think in Canada, it's been fantastic, especially for rural uh, areas. Um, it's given a new breath to some, you know, uh, suppliers that, um, yeah, created, like, think about it, packaging, labeling, machinery, like we need, you know, electricians, everything. Mm, that, that's really interesting. Uh, we have a question, uh, and just to remind everyone who's who's listening, we'd, we'd love to hear your questions as well. And Joanne is asking a question, and she wants to know, can you tell us about the consumable market? What kind of products are available to eat and drink in Canada? Maybe, Corinne, you can take that. Yeah, so um, most of the market right now, about I think it's about 80% is still dried flour. Um, and, um, you know, one of the reason I think, you know, going back to what George was saying in terms of replacing the black market, um, the illicit market, sorry, um, is, you know, the, the kind of product we can we could do. So we can do edibles, uh, think about gummies and think about like, uh, tea God has, um, we have a powder, uh, it's called Ripple, that can be added to anything, um, but we're limited to 10 milligrams of THC uh, per edible, uh, whereas in the illicit market, there's absolutely no limit, um, so that has been uh, a challenge, but yeah, think beverages, uh, vapes, of course, are a big category, um, oils, um, so there is a lot of space for innovation as long as you can meet the uh, stringent uh, regulations. Um, so it's, uh, it's more limited than, let's say, what you would see in Colorado or California, but there's still some, uh, some space for, for innovation. So, so um, and I, this is for both uh, George and Corinne, I, I think, you know, what I'm hearing you say is that uh, essentially you overbuilt the capacity um, uh, and one of the reasons was because the illicit market was not taken into consideration, right? Is that, is that what you're saying or that, you know, or, or it's just the demand not there? You know, I'm trying to figure out what is, what's, what should we be thinking about uh, in terms of, uh, for example, incentivizing uh, companies to create uh, these uh, production facilities? Is there, a, is there some, some um, governor that we should have on, on that? Right. I, I think I think it's the lack of uh, on the part of our regulator, Health Canada. They never have made an attempt to characterize the Canadian market uh, and to extrapolate that into a let's say a square foot requirement. They allowed a free market approach basically, and the capital markets were very very uh, uh, liquid <laughs> for mm -hmm. the cannabis space for a period of time. And this, this uh, created the capacity challenge because there was so much built. The biggest argument I could make right now, Dottie, is that we need more aggressive policy in Canada to strip away the illicit market because we've already got all the, capa we've already got all the capacity ready to meet the entire market. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit the challenge that we're, uh, uh, you know, a little bit the challenge that we're struck with. So my advice to regulators would be uh, to uh, attempt to right to a uh, right size or take a stab at uh, having an appropriate amount of growing space uh, in relation to the anticipated uh, uh, in relation to the anticipated market. That's interesting. 
And I would, I would add, oh, sorry, I would add to that, that the way that the regulations are made in Canada, it, it makes it very difficult for uh, collaboration between cannabis and non-cannabis companies. And that, that is something that I think the regulators in New York should look at, because let's say you, know, you were, we were just talking about the kind of product that we could put out there. Let's say that the Green Organic Dutchman wanted to do an ice cream, which we, we couldn't do because it's not shelf stable, but just for the sake of argument here, um, you know, it would be a lot better, a, a better product if we could, for example, partner with, I don't know, Ben and Jerry's, who are already making ice cream and are really good at it, or a smaller, you know, Florida Lake ice cream here, um, instead of having to reinvent the wheel and, and buy the machinery as it has mm. been here. So this is something like uh, that should be looked at at the regulators, and that would uh, benefit more companies if you could actually partner without having to go through the whole licensing and, and having Got separate, uh, completely separate buildings and, and all that jazz. You, Corinne, Corinne's point is you could create the you could create the joint venture or the strategic relationship, but you couldn't uh, then have that uh, work done in existing facilities or what have you, you'd, you'd mm. still be under the pressure to create, uh, uh, create sort of greenfield, uh, uh, greenfield facilities. Obviously, that's a very expensive way to go. I, I think Corinne used the word innovation before talking about products. And I personally think this is the most exciting story that's going on. You know, that big uh, company, Sam Adams from uh, Boston is making a, a research investment in uh, Ontario to try and get their uh, cannabis beverage up and running in a sense, because the beverages are, it's a tricky bit. It's not that easy to, uh, it's not that easy to make a good, uh, to make a good tasting beverage, but we've seen so much uh, progress on that, on that basis, innovation. One thing that I think is very interesting is that we think about cannabis very often in uh it, it, it brings out the context of uh, get high. And that's where the stigma comes in. Of course, that's an aspect of it. But if, if we are seeing a, a group, a demographic group where there's growth in consumption, it's amongst uh, seniors. And really mm. the point is that uh, people are, and they're not looking for high THC flower. They're not, uh, they're not looking to uh, party with their teenagers or, their, uh, or what have you. Uh, they're really looking for uh, health and lifestyle ailment uh, release as so much uh, relief as so much of us, uh, so many of us are, uh, you know, experiencing aches and pains and such. And I think this really also speaks to the exciting future of products and really of the exciting future of how big the marketplace is. I think you've answered this question, but one of our um, listeners has, uh, her, Shana has asking, as a consumables manufacturer, she's a consumables manufacturer, can you tell us about any dual licensing situations that have developed in Canada for those orgs who want to be cultivators and produce oil and, and added value goods on the consumable side? I think this is, uh, George, what you were sort of just talking about with Sam Adams, but are there, are there other examples of that that, uh, that you can share with Shana? Well, in the beverage, maybe these are good examples. Corinne probably has some also. In the beverage space, we've seen a lot of investment from uh, uh, people that are already in the alcohol beverage space or beer. Uh, so the biggest names, uh, of course, Constellation is uh, invested in Canopy Growth, uh, one of our larger uh, companies. That's quite well known. But in the uh, uh, in um, uh, you see uh, Molson uh, Molson Coors is active. Labatt, uh, uh, which is part of InBev, the global chain, uh, is active in a joint venture consortium with a licensed cannabis uh, grower. So a lot of the beverage, uh, alcohol beverage consumable folks have uh, been drawn into joint ventures with uh, cannabis licensed producers. Excellent. Um, so Oh, go ahead. Corinne, you have something to add to that? I was just going to add, um, so yes, there have been those joint ventures, but, you know, I think the, one of the things in Canada is the marketing uh, regulations make it harder to bank on those uh, joint venture. For example, if you're developing a cannabis beer, well, you just can't call it beer. Uh, you can't use the, the course name if you're associated with them. So basically, you're losing all of that benefit of using, you know, a Ben and Jerry, just to take that example yeah. again, yeah. you'd have to call it something completely different. So yes, you benefit from some of the know-how, but you still have to build a different facility, name it something different and have names that are completely unrelated to the alcohol business or 
or, or well, anything that uh, would be attractive to to children, for example. Mm. And and also alongside that, Dottie, a severe limitation on the participation of uh, noteworthy individuals, uh, celebrity endorsers. Oh, really? And I I really think that this is a this is the Canadian law was uh, of course uh, uh, constructed at a time uh, when we weren't imagining legalization in the United States. But it's gonna be very, very difficult for brand survival for many of our companies to be in a situation where they're constrained by all of these marketing and advertising and branding rules, whereas uh, the massive market to the South might not have the same constraints. And I think this poses you know, what is going to happen five years hence with cannabis products crossing the rainbow bridge or what have you, right. uh, that might not happen immediately, but one could imagine that those pressures will emerge over time. And the branding differential that we're experiencing up here is very likely to be uh, very likely to, to stand as a significant challenge for us in building brand, you know, brand growth. I think that's, that's going to come up again and again and again. So, so would you, uh, the question I have, and I think you're kind of in the process of answering is what have been the largest obstacles in rooting a cannabis economy? But, you know, again, what, what's sort of coming through uh, in your, in your answers, it sounds like is almost like an overregulation that's creating, you know, it's constraining growth. Is that, am I, am I hearing you correctly, Corinne and George and Kim? So the first thing I would I would go back to what George said at the beginning, when Canada put together the legalization plan and the regulation, there are two objectives. It was uh, protecting youth and public health. And um, they also wanted to replace uh, the, the, you know, this place the illicit market. There was absolutely no economic mandate in the legalization in Canada. And I think that that's a huge mistake to not look at the opportunities and, and help us basically build an industry. Um, governments have been much busier trying to spend the money from the revenue than helping us create more revenue, which is kind of sad. Um, mm. And so I think that any country or state, you know, looking at legalization now has to have this, this economic mandate. Otherwise, it's making it uh, really hard. Um, and you know they were quite open about the, the how they were doing it in Canada. They said we will overregulate, and then it's easier to um, ease the regulation than add after, right? Because they saw some of the mistakes mistakes that Colorado had made, for example, with edibles, right, where they were way too potent what was on the market, um, and so they dialed it back. But they dialed it back so so hard that that it's making it difficult. Um, hopefully, so soon in October, we have a um, mandatory review of the act that's uh, automatically starting three years after legalization. So with George and the industry, we're working hard to, you know, talk to the government and convince them that they need to look at the broader regulation and act, not just, um, you know, the effect on, on Aboriginal and youth population. Um, but I won't lie to you, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the up, uphill battle. And, you know, we were created by the government with the legalization, but sometimes we feel like, you know, the, um, the cousin that no one really wants to see at the Christmas party, you know, <laughs> like, like it's, you're part of the family, but we don't want to hear too much from you. And don't make, don't make noise, please, you know, and it's crazy, because any government that that created that kind of you know numbers of jobs and size of industry should be proud of it they should you know they should uh, scream it over the long and they should be helping us more for example when it comes to looking at other countries like europe for example like export from canada to europe there are there is some but they could be more uh to medical markets for example um and they could actually be supporting us a lot more so that's my two cents it's, George, does anything you want to add to that? Or well, you... I just want to say the same thing, but you know, D Corinna said it so well. It's really challenging for us because the construct of the Cannabis Act was all social, i.e., uh, you know, the youth consumption or, or, or criminal justice issues, and it's the government, in a certain sense, struggles to celebrate the success that they've achieved. One thing that we didn't speak to, Dottie, like, like the United States, Canada is a massive uh, landmass, and the cannabis industry 
uh, has uh, landed its investments in a really powerful distributed way, impacting all of the regions of the country. And many, many industries wish that they had that kind of sectoral leverage where politicians in all the places could be spoken to and such. But even when we're going to the government and saying, well, look, you know, around the world, medicinal cannabis is being invited by jurisdiction after jurisdiction. We're the acknowledged leader. Canada has a trusted supply of safe and tested cannabis. They're not, you'd think that they'd be, a, that they'd want, well, let's get that export parade going, people. That's jobs, jobs, jobs. But the enthusiasm for it is really, it's really very limited. And mm. uh, that's, uh, that, that's a real, um, and I think that there's a, I think that there's an aspect of stigma in that, but I think it's more that the construct of our law in, within Health Canada, which is not an economically focused uh, uh, enterprise, right, right. Um, it, it has has created uh, has created real constraints for us. We're spending a lot of time trying to find elsewhere in the government people that would be willing. Sometimes we say champion; that's a very strong word. You know, trying to find other people that will you know come in our favor and try and support more exports, more regulation around CBD. This is a place where in the United States, of course, CBD, CBD is everywhere. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe that got ahead of the FDA, uh, but in Canada, CBD is almost nowhere. The government has been so focused on THC regulation, put very little into CBD, and there are a lot of global marketplace opportunities in that space also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to, just to go back to it, that's where, that's where uh, it's a big opportunity for Buffalo Niagara. Uh, because, you know, if Canada is continuing to be so stringent, uh, you know, there's a big uh, economic opportunity for, 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 for you uh, and your members because, you know, the, the faster here we see, you know, the only people that are still obsessed with cannabis are politicians. There's a, a you know, a survey that came out yesterday, um, uh, approval of, of legalization is up to 80% of this country, right? Wow. So, so politician not embracing it, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be eventually at their detriment. Um, but that's where, you know, the opportunity to go talk to le your legislator, talk about the economic opportunity that it's creating and how you want to participate. And, you know, to go back to what Keenan was saying at the beginning, like for us to have the Hamilton Chamber so active, tremendously helpful because we were facing a municipality that didn't want anything to do with with legal cannabis they were much happier just p playing ostrich head in the sand no no it doesn't exist where actually there were 80 illegal stores there were you know a lot of illegal grow up we still see things like every you know month in in the Hamilton region you know catching uh, illicit market so for us to have the support of the chamber was tremendous because um, you know, our initial plan was to build much bigger in Hamilton, and we had to change our plans because the municipality was so um, uh, hard to deal with. Um, mm. And so we moved a lot of the capacity that we were supposed to do in Hamilton to another province. So it's just oh. to give you an idea, we're one company. How many companies, you know, are acting like this if they don't have the support of uh, the local government? So. Thank God we had their support. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, we, we, we were able to, to build their facility and it's been successful, but um, definitely it's an opportunity for, for your group. Yeah, that, that actually was my next question. I was going to ask Keenan, you know, how can the uh, partnership and our other chambers throughout New York State uh, be a leader uh, in this development of this industry and, and, be, and to make sure that it is the economic driver that the potential, you know, is there, Keenan, what, what advice would you give me and, and my well, counterparts here? So I, I definitely say start early, which you have. And, and this is why, you know, you can see why this is so fascinating from a, a policy perspective. And as a supporter of private industry, you know, we're seeing the birth of a whole new industry and a regulatory regime and, and all of that. And it's just fascinating, really, and, and an interesting topic. Um, you're going to have your advocacy moment um, if it's not happening already, you know, in, in terms of weighing in on what the regulatory regime looks like. And for us, it came really unexpectedly. We had our, the previous provincial government was going to uh, basically roll out sales through 
our um, our liquor control board. So our all, all of our liquor sales are are through a government owned um, entity, and they were going to replicate that for for cannabis. Then the new government came in, a, a conservative government, and said, "No, we're actually going to do a private sector model where you know private private sales." And I thought. That's that's amazing. I, I, that's something that I really, really want to support, especially here in Hamilton. What they did is they allowed uh, municipalities to opt out of that. So thus giving you the opportunity just once to say, yes, we'll, we'll accept uh, these retail uh, private sector retail in our in our community or no, we will not. And then who knows when you're going to have the opportunity to, to opt in. And so for us, it was just a, a no brainer to step up and say, come on, folks, like, this is where it, it really is a matter of, of prudishness versus prudence. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, you'll find this prudishness is, is really endemic everywhere, everywhere, but especially in government. Um, and so we had uh, the opportunity to shape the vote here in council. Um, and we did, we, we switched a couple votes. And I thought, you know, this is really important for us to be able to, for the, the Green Organic Dutchmans and all the other licensed producers to know that they're coming into a community that is embracing this as opposed to, as Corinne said, uh, you know, burying their heads in the sand. We were, we were this close and we, we really did. We, we, we went, you know, it was like whipping the vote and, 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 you know, you found some really interesting allies and then you found some really, really, you know, intransigent prudishness. And, and so we were able to break through that. And, and thus, you know, we have the 100 legal retail stores here in Hamilton, whereas, I, I, like I said, we had 80 illegal and it was like, folks, there's obviously a demand here. Right. Um, would you not rather this be sold through the the the, the legal uh, regime, which is far better financed? We know where the the, the money is uh, coming from. It's you know all the illegal uh, stores were were backed by the illicit uh, you know uh, sellers, which are obviously much more unsavory. Now we've got stores that look like Apple stores, you know, that are selling mm -hmm. cannabis and um, at a high level, and and it's just so it's such a a, a better regime to be uh, to be in. And, and we just, we had that moment and we, we flipped the votes and we got it done. And thus, as a result, you know, um, companies like the Green Organic Dutchman are, are thankful and found, okay, we can, we can invest in, in this community. So I, I'm really happy to, to, for Kareen to have said that because it, it really did make a difference uh, to our local uh, economy. And I think, I think every, you know, uh, chamber across uh, New York state is probably gonna have that same, there's gonna be a local fight that you have to take up the, the side of, of private industry and common sense. Yeah, so, you know, this um, question, you know, you all, and I know, uh, George, you probably have a deeper understanding than, than, than I do even about what the New York state law is compared to uh, what Canada's laws are. And I guess if you would just maybe point out for us some of the things that are in the New York state law that are opportunities that maybe didn't exist in Canada, the things that we should be paying attention to, uh, to accelerate the, the work here. So I don't know who wants to take the lead on, you know, sort of that, you know, the actual I'll, legislation. I'll take, I'll take the lead to say, Dottie, I, I don't know that much about it, except that two okay. things stood out to me, uh, the consumption lounges, because I'm a consumer. And here we're having a really, really difficult time advancing, uh, advancing that, com that conversation. Uh, but I think really more than anything else, it's the foundation of uh, equity considerations. Uh, we're going to try belatedly to uh, cut the, reshape the pie to bring indigenous communities in because uh, the government was moving at such a rapid pace last time, they couldn't really find agreement with First Nations, et cetera. So I think really it's that equity, it's really about that equity piece that I'm most excited about. And there's one thing that Keenan, uh, when Keenan was speaking, there's one thing that I just wanted to reference, might not be exactly uh, on point right now, but. I'm regularly now asking the bureaucrats in Ottawa, what is the obligation of a regulator to create a healthy regulated sector? Because um, mm. I was the energy minister in Ontario. When we moved energy projects forward, they had an 8% embedded expected return of investment for the, in the, within the energy sector. Mm -hmm. There are other examples of sectors which operate with embedded expectation of return in their dealings with government. 
But in the cannabis space, we really haven't experienced in Ottawa, where the regulator has kind of unleashed us, uh, very much obligation or I want to say moral consideration for the health of those that they license. And I think that's, uh, to me, that's just wrong. And it's something that we have to continue to draw attention to. But going back to the question, what should New York seek to get right? Before I was talking about trying to right size the production or cultivation so that you don't have all this outstripped uh, uh, capital and such. It's that, it's, it's that regulator's obligation to create a healthy regulated sector that I would you know, kind of be pushing people to rely upon more because we, haven't, we don't have that here. Mm. I, would, um, I would add to Keenan's point earlier. I think that in the New York um, legislation, there's also a municipality up-out option. Um, and so it would be important for, for your group to start talking to the legislator to make sure that um, your municipalities are going to opt in. Um, here, we see a lot of stores closing due to COVID, uh, but we see a lot of space, like we're closing Starbucks, but there are dispensaries being opened, like, you know, Kina was saying, like 100 in Hamilton. So if you're a landlord, like if you have real estate, this is a great opportunity, right? Um, mm -hmm. so, so that's one thing that, that um, you know, I would say to start looking at it right now. Um, in terms of success of legalization, I always say there are five aspects to it. The first two are on products of so price and quality. Um, on price, it's uh, basically for government to not start to tax it too early, uh, you know, to allow the producers to compete with the illicit market so that the prices are not too high. Quality, we're working on it. I'm, we're, we're producing really, really good quality cannabis. So anyone that tells you that what's in the legal market is is not what the illicit market is doing, is, is not true. Um, in Vancouver, not too long ago, they actually tested product from the illicit market and it's full of crap. I'm sorry to say it like this, but you know, <laughs> uh, at least in the uh, legal market, you know, it's been tested, you know, you know the, from the microbial testing, everything has been done. So you're buying actually uh, safe product, uh, so which is important. Access is important. That's where the municipalities come in, right? If there are no legal stores, people will stay in the illicit market. Um, education is very important. So yes, government can uh, you know, have that taxation money, but it should actually go back to educating the public about you know, things like I was saying, like illicit products are not tested and the myths that the illicit um, product comes from a little farmer that's doing it and the, that that's also you know a myth so it has to be changed and then lastly it's enforcement making sure that governments uh, you know and, and uh, public safety goes after these uh, illicit um, uh, players in the market whether they're online or um, or not um, so without these five elements it's, it's going to be really hard to have a successful legalization Dottie, I just want to make a couple of points. So um, sure. Mississauga, which is a city of about 800,000 between here and, and Toronto, opted out of uh, the, the legal retail regime. And uh, thus, right now, they're, they're dealing with illicit stores to the extent that they even exist in Mississauga. Otherwise, people are, are going from, you know, to outside of Mississauga to, uh, to purchase their cannabis, which obviously helps the, the surrounding municipalities. But, you know, why would an entity like TGOD invest in Mississauga if they're, they're just not, you know, embracing this and all the way down, you know, obviously, you got your, your political actors, but economic development as well, takes cues from the political actors, right? So why would they, you know, so anyway, I, I think that is very injurious uh, to uh, to their local economy. And and I, I, I just wanted to underscore what Kareen was saying that um, the, the amount of sophistication in these licensed operations is just absolutely incredible. I've, I've, I've gone uh, through a few of them. The, the cleanliness standards, the the equipment, um, it really is just amazing. Like you could see all the other investments uh, from, you know, other industries like, you know, that are just uh, completely uh, embedded within uh, these these highly sophisticated um, 
operations. And I haven't been to any illicit uh, grow ops, um, but I assume that they are just not at that same standard. And, and so as a result, um, they produce a uh, product that's just not as healthy as well. But uh, I would just encourage anybody to who has an opportunity Go visit uh, one of these uh, regulate, regulated um, uh, operations, and you will come away with a completely different view of of the industry. It's just absolutely incredible. Well, you know, we've got a couple. We have a question, and I have a question. I'm going to put them together uh, because they relate to the sort of this bias against cannabis that you all have brought up. Um, so, with this sort of a uh, uh, couple of things, with your uh, two year look back, almost three year look back has uh, cannabis consumption increased that you know of and that, you know, uh, or any facts or figures related to that? And also, do you know of any health benefits that have happened and sort of uh, societally uh, that's from one of our uh, listeners uh, since, uh, since legalization? So uh, Corinne, maybe we'll start with you on, on that one. Um, well, and I'm sure George will want to chime in, but uh, when we look at data, one of the things that we see is that people are more open to talk about their um, cannabis consumption. So it's hard to say if the change in, in, in data is, is just because now people are willing to talk about it uh, or, or it was really it increased a little, uh, but we have a better handle on, on data now, now that, it's, um, that it's legal. Um, I, uh, in Canada, we face an opioid crisis um, that's quite uh, important and tragic. Um, and so, you know, more uh, people are now turning to cannabis, especially for, for pain management. Um, so, you know, in that aspect, yes, it has had a benefit, um, uh, you know, a good um, uh, aspect of, of, of legalization. But George, I'm sure, wants to add to this. I, I wanted to talk about that very, very interesting Hamilton specific story of uh, Leuna, the Laborers International Union. Of course, this is a massive North American union. I got to go to one of their pep rallies in Washington, D.C. once. It's uh, led by a very, very uh, 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 passionate Hamiltonian, one of Hamilton's most important citizens. That union is noteworthy, in my opinion, because they've invested a lot of their laborers' uh, pension funds in the legal cannabis space, and in so doing have created a model of medicinal cannabis for their employees, which is tens of thousands of laborers. I think it's well known within the opioid crisis that those most impacted were men, and many of them actually, uh, looking at some data that I'd seen in British Columbia, many of them had casual linkages to the construction and trades industry and such, where there's a high rate of workplace injury. There's also a high rate of workplace uh, uh, alcohol and opioid uh, consumption. And I think that what we're starting to see is that uh, cannabis as a medicine is uh, going to prove effective at replacing uh, some other uh, forms of, uh, you know, uh, of more uh, problematic impairment. And I think that um, sometimes cannabis suffers from the drug war stories of being an on-ramp drug. Oh yes, it starts with cannabis and leads to other things. My own personal experience with drug abuse many decades ago, and a lot of evidence today, I think, is that cannabis can actually be an off-ramp drug, and that we're seeing a lot of research where uh, the medicinal benefits and opportunities are going to come more into the fore. And I think that's a really, really exciting turning point for uh, uh, turning point for cannabis. Yeah. Um, and Dottie, I just want to address yeah. because it was it was actually in the paper this morning. Uh, McMaster University study McMaster's here in, in Hamilton found that um, uh, that uh, cannabis consumption has not increased among those uh, who had already uh, you know enjoyed cannabis before uh, legalization. Um, in fact, it's decreased a little bit. It has increased among you know as as George said, uh, the people who would never visit the illicit cannabis market, but who now can. You know, my parents and and, and those uh, of, of that generation who are looking for something other than opioids or who are looking to take advantage of, of some of the, 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 the statements made by the cannabis industry, whether they're 
true or not, people are are dabbling, and uh, because of the stigma, is coming down. You're seeing this uh, conversation happening among my parents when I, I never would have expected this. So it, it's 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 it is really really interesting what it will do to uh, to society, uh, you know, generation uh, over generation. That's really interesting. Um, Audie, yeah, Audie, George. Notably, the most important use statistic that we're going to be held to is any evidence of increases in youth consumption. Right. We have, we have not seen any statistical in instances of that. And in fact, we've seen data that shows that the onset of first consumption amongst youth is actually delayed in the period mm. since legalization. So wow. those are really, really important stats that we look to first because that's where our regulator is first measuring us. As um, I think it was the New York Times said, you know, Canada made cannabis boring. You know, if you're a kid <laughs> and your grandpa, your grandparents are talking about taking it, there's no attraction to it, right? And just to go back to one of the things, like George said earlier, people who think that uh, cannabis is a gateway drug, um, it is right now because it's sold by the same person. You know, the, right. the same pusher goes to, you know, youth with a lot of options. When you take cannabis out of the equation and, you know, you basically cut the, the jobs for these people, um, it, it's not, right? So, so that's, that's an important factor. And that's, that's why Canada did legalization. It was all about protecting youth. So, Well, uh, that, that's really great. Uh, uh, there, we did get a question from Joanne. Do municipalities in New York State have the option to opt out of allowing retail stores? And the answer to that is yes. Cities, towns, and villages can opt out of sales within their own borders. So uh, just, Joanne, to, that, to answer that question for you. Um, so um, uh, there's a question here from one of our uh, viewers. Can you send the data that shows no increase in youth consumption? George, I don't know. Do, is there data that's available? Uh, your sound is off. But you're, we on mute. you're on mute. Yeah. But, uh, send it to Canada. us. And, and I know will... I'm on mute. That's why I gave the thumbs up. I'm going <laughs> to find it and send it along. All right. Perfect. And we'll, and we'll send it out with our uh, confirmation to, uh, to all the attendees and the, and the survey. So, um, so I guess we really are, we're kind of out of time, but I appreciate so much everything that uh, you've shared and there's a, there are so many lessons uh, learned here. Uh, Keenan, thank you for, uh, you know, being willing to to uh, help us put this together. Uh, and really, it's the first, I think, public discussion we've had in our region about uh, about this opportunity as an industry. And we look to lead and, and we'll uh, count on your advice and counsel, as we always do. George, thank you for your insights. Uh, just an amazing uh, experience. And uh, we appreciate uh, becoming friends with you. And Corinne, uh, I wish you the best of luck in your, in your business and, and, and know that uh, if I'm going to buy organic or consume organic uh, marijuana, I don't, I'm not a consumer now. So I don't, uh, I, I might, I'm going to be one of those old people probably with an ache and pain down the road. Um, I'll be sure to, to stop in and, and visit, visit you. Um, and as a reminder, uh, we're going to continue the discussion uh, about the new cannabis economy, and we'll welcome anybody here uh, who wants to participate in that event on July 15th, a legalized cannabis in the workplace. And, and I will tell you that that event will have a little bit of a different take in the sense that some of our employers here are concerned about the impact on the, on, on the work floor about the legalization of cannabis. So uh, you can register again uh, at the address you see on your screen. And thank you all for your participation uh, in spending an hour with us today. We, we appreciate it very much and uh, have a wonderful day. Take care. Be well, Thank Buffalo. Take care. See you soon. Bye. Great job, George. Corinne. Good oh, to see you. My pleasure. Entirely. Thank you. Hey, Ke Keenan. Yes. You got to tell people that the government got rid, you know, they introduced private retail, but they kept the distribution monopoly. And yeah. it's honestly like, it's a hybrid that's really challenging. That's true. And, yeah. 